Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, Green Mountain Care Board meeting that was recessed this morning until one o'clock. Um, at this time, we're going to move to a, a dis different discussion on uh, provider reimbursement. And uh, to tee that all off, I'm going to turn the meeting over to our executive director, Susan Barrett. Susan. Thank you, Chair Mullen. I uh, want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's meeting. It's going to be a very uh, interesting discussion on uh, reimbursement in the state of Vermont. Um, we have, um, what I'll do is I'll give you an overview of the goals of the meeting, and then I'll introduce the panelists and set up the rest of the meeting for you. Uh, so the goals today are to understand what's in a claim, what's in, what's in a premium, and how that relates to reimbursement in different settings. Another goal of the meeting is to, to talk about the, the role of the Green Mountain Care Board and the extent of its authority in the insurance market. And um, we'll have uh, to start things off our staff, Sarah Lindbergh, um, who's the head of our data team, and Amarin Abergeli, who's our Associate General Counsel, go through some slides to tee up those, um, those issues and, and give some more background on those issues. Um, so next I'm going to introduce the panelists, but before I do that, I did want to make a note that um, when I sent out this invite for today's discussion, we realized that COVID was surging, that we were, um, that you, many of the people on the front lines are dealing um, with the COVID issues. And now this week, uh, thankfully, um, the vaccine is, is starting to get rolled out. So um, I did put that out to all of the presenters that if this was just too much uh, to um, handle with the, the schedule and the time constraints that, um, you know, we certainly understand and if they couldn't attend. And, and Vaz um, did take us up on this offer. They are, as many folks now know, very um, in the center of uh, distributing a lot of the vaccines and, and administering them. So um, I just wanted to make that note and that uh, we will follow up with them on any uh, questions from today, but um, we really do appreciate their, their work on the front lines as well as all of the folks here uh, on the panel. I know it's been a long nine months. Um, so why don't I uh, just go through the panelists and just, it, this is on our agenda, but just to introduce folks. Um, first, we have Georgia Meharis, who is the Vice President of Policy and Strategy at Bi-State Bi Primary Care Association. Next, we have Matt McKinnon, who is Senior Leader, Network Management at MVP Healthcare. Next is Andrew Garland, Vice President of Client Relations and External Affairs at Blue Cross Blue Shield, Vermont. Next, we have Susan Ridzen, the Executive Director of Health First. And in addition to the uh, panel uh, panelists today, we have um, also from Health First, Paul, Dr. Paul Rice, who is the Chief Medical Officer and Partner at Evergreen Family Health. And then um, last but certainly not least is Alicia Cooper, Director of Payment Reform, Reimbursement and Rate Setting at the Department of Health Access. Um, so what I'll do now is turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh and Amarin Abergeli, who have a brief presentation to set up uh, this discussion and give some background information. Uh, then we'll go back to the panelists and we do have a few questions that we uh, that I'll be putting forth to the panelists but then we'll open it up to questions from the board and then of course public comment so I can great turn it over to Amarin and Sarah Good afternoon. Uh, this is Sarah Lindbergh, who heads the data team for the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, there was a little bit of trouble with some folks seeing my screen this morning, so I just want to make sure that folks are able to see the title slide I'm presenting. So I can see it, but I saw your screen this morning and others did not. So is everybody seeing it? I can see I it. I can see it. Yes. Yep. I can and see it. Wonderful. Great. Wonderful. If, if they can't see it, we can always um, put that in the chat box and a link to the um, website like we did. In fact, Amber, um, Abigail, could you just go ahead and link the slides 
in the chat so folks can get it if they can't see it on the screen. That'd be great. Great, and I'll try to keep myself honest uh, when I'm presenting to, uh, for the slides. So um, I'm gonna start off and then turn it over to Amarin um, to speak about the, um, the insurance rate review portion of our presentation. Um, but here, we're just here to just set out um, some groundwork about the overview and the GMCB authority as it relates to commercial health insurance reimbursement. Um, so there's really three kind of major concepts that we felt would be helpful that everyone was kind of operating on similar definitions for. Um, knowing, <laughs> I, I always hesitate to try and tee anything up because there are so many exceptions to any rule in, in, the, in this area. So um, please know that uh, we know there's always special <laughs> cases, but we're trying to speak as well as we can to general generalities. Um, so the first term um, would be health insurance premium, which we're thinking of as the cost to a policyholder to maintain health insurance coverage, which is usually paid on a monthly basis. Um, and you know, for most purposes, that commercial insurance is provided either through an employer or through purchase in um, the marketplace through Vermont Health Connect. Um, there's certainly also the option to directly purchase insurance through uh, an insurer at this point. Um, and then we're going to talk about, when we talk about reimbursement, where we're talking about the amount paid to a medical provider for uh, delivering medical care. And that is often based on the amount negotiated between the provider and the either the insurer and or the purchaser, um, the purchaser being um, usually an employer and a self-funded policy. Um, and then a medical claim would be the request from the medical provider to the insurer or the um, you know, agent acting as an administrator for the purchaser for the payment of those healthcare services um, that are delivered to the covered policyholder. So those are kind of like the three main state, uh, principles we're gonna try to just lay some groundwork for before your discussion. And with that, I'll turn to slide three and let Amarin speak. Thanks, Sarah. So speaking about uh, insurance in Vermont, we wanted to give you a broad overview of where people have insurance as a uh, first place to start. So we have a chunk of the Vermont population has commercial insurance. And in this category, we're talking about fully insured and also self-funded. And then we have other government insurance, which would be uh, federal employee health benefit plans, military employee plans, and then Medicare and Medicaid. And then we have a very small percentage of uninsured Vermonters. So when we're talking about the board's jurisdiction, the board has jurisdiction over small group and individual uh, plans and the fully insured large group plans. And in Vermont, that's about 94,000 covered lives. Uh, this is based on 2018 data, which is our most recent uh, full year data at the moment. Right now, there's approximately uh, between 620 and 630,000 Vermonters. So the board's jurisdiction is about 15% of commercially insured Vermonters. The breakdown within that 94, 95,000 people is usually in the last few years, about 75,000 uh, covered individuals are in small group plans and insurance plan and individual plans. And then about 20,000 are in fully insured large group plans. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in thinking about how reimbursement relates to the board's jurisdiction over rate review. We wanted to give you a visual. Um, I know I appreciate a visual when I'm trying to understand uh, the math involved in rate review. So this is an example of a per member per month rate increase. And we took this from a previous year's uh, approved rate in the small group and individual market. So if you're looking at the very top line, and say this was for a premium increase of approximately 10%. Um, you would have a rate increase on a rate increase on a per member per month of about $51. So to read this graph, you're going to look down from the top line and then read down each line. So if you're talking about a total rate increase of about $51, within that you have changes in claims is going to be about $43 of that 51. And then on the right side in the green. Uh, boxes and yellow boxes, you're having um, admin costs and contributions to reserve. That's the CTR. 
So looking down through, funneling down through the blue boxes, we're gonna go down through claims. Uh, there are some boxes in here that get at, let's say, uh, actuarial adjustments that need to be made in order to understand the full impact of a rate change. So I, I won't get into the details of some of these boxes because it is rather a, a math exercise that I barely understand myself. Um, so we go down through population claims and then the third blue row down, you have medical claims. And then at the bottom line here, we have a uh, unit cost trend, utilization trend, and then cost trend and utilization trend again under prescription claims. So the box we're really focusing on here today when we're talking about uh, reimbursement for medical claims is the unit cost trend there in the red box. So um, I'm hoping that this will help provide a visual as we're having this conversation about uh, the board's jurisdiction in rate review and, and what components go into a rate increase and what the board reviews as part of um, its approval of rates in terms of reimbursement and cost trend. Uh, next slide, please. Sarah, next slide, please. <laughs> I'm trying. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there we so, go. <laughs> thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about unit cost trend as part of rate review. The board approves an average unit cost trend percentage increase for each rate filing. And if you go to the board's web page and go to our rate review page, you can take a look into each of the past filings and see what the board uh, looked at. You can see what companies have filed for their unit cost trend, and you can see what the board has approved for unit cost trends. So for, um, but let me, but I'm sorry. Uh, Uh, okay, um, so approved unit cost trend, what is it? So the unit cost trend is the rate increase that the insurer is permitted to add to its premiums to cover the increase in reimbursement rates that the insurer expects to pay for members covered by the filing. So the insurer is going to look at what they have for their current reimbursement rates with providers for the current year, what they anticipate those rates are going to be um, following contract negotiations for the plan you're covered by this filing, and then presumably there are going to be some other um, reimbursements that are not covered by a contract. Um, and so what is what is not uh, in the approved unit cost trend? So when the board approves a unit cost trend, the board doesn't set reimbursement rates between insurers and uh, individual providers. But the purpose of the unit cost trend increase is to basically make sure that the rates that are being charged to uh, to policyholders um, are adequate to cover the cost of claims and the insurer's administrative costs in managing those plans. So, and the longer way of saying that is that the unit cost trend increase approved by the board is to adjust premiums to cover the anticipated reimbursement rate changes for insurers payments to providers and we're talking about providers both in Vermont outside of Vermont and we're talking in all the settings hospitals FQHCs independent providers and we're talking about all types of services whether they be outpatient inpatient um, or professional services and each of these unit cost trend increases are specific um, what the board is approving is specific to the filing that they are viewing whether it be um, a small group individual filing from one carrier, whether it's a, a large group, fully insured um, group from an insurer. And, and that I think is my overview. <laughs> High level, but there you have it. <laughs> I'm going to pass it back All to right. you. <laughs> Thank you, Amarin. Um, so yeah, so um, I'm going to start talking more about some of the more data E type portions of this and so um, when we're talking about reimbursement uh, I think that that is the way that the provider um, gets payments and those payments could be based on the services delivered um, as we think of in a typical fee-for-service arrangement it could be reimbursed based on a time period so a per diem for a hospital stay might be the way that the payment works 
um, there might be an episode or an event related to the reimbursement. So um, a joint replacement or a, a healthy newborn. There also can be reimbursement based on an individual. So care coordination payments or capitation are examples of reimbursements that are tied to a person. Uh, and when I think of the total reimbursement, generally, I'm thinking about an allowed amount, which is what the providers are theoretically um, expected to receive, which is both the, the insurer's obligation as well as the expected patient payment, knowing that a lot of mischief can happen in both of those buckets. <clears throat> reimbursement is not the charger price. So um, that would be the amount requested by the provider to deliver a medical service. So that is, is not necessarily what is actually reimbursed for that. Um, it's neither is it the cost. And when we talk about cost, I think that's where, um, where a lot of people have different definitions, particularly depending on their interface with the healthcare delivery system. So for patients, that's usually in their mind, the out-of-pocket obligation for their medical care. Whereas for a provider, it's usually they think of that as the expense that they had to incur in order to deliver the medical care. And, and that can be, you know, system wide, um, like including the cost to, to plow the parking lot or other kind of large, um, larger than just that one encounter. And then for payers, um, I think they're usually thinking about the expenses associated with the medical care. So the risk of exposure they have but also the administration to provide um, those services to the health insurance policyholders, including um, you know, costs associated with risk and reserve for unforeseen events. Um, so just a very high level overview of a, of a medical claim, which is related to these reimbursements. Um, so a patient would, in the upper left-hand corner on slide eight, you see um, you know, someone with a broken arm who received medical care from a provider. And um, usually, but not always, the patient is asked to, you know, pay some portion of that reimbursement, um, either at the point of service or at a later date. Um, then the provider sends a bill with the requested amount to an insurer or a claims processor. And that's where the medical claim comes in. That's like the invoice for the services that they delivered. And then that um, request is processed by the insurer in the bottom right-hand corner. And that's when the, the request or claim is reviewed to make sure that that patient was covered for that care at that time. And if so, um, the insurer would look at the negotiated amount of reimbursement and send their share back to the provider. So again, that's like the very simple overview of how a medical claim works in a medical um, encounter like this. And so those medical claims on slide nine um, generally come in two major flavors. Like I said, there's always exceptions, but generally um, services are requested for reimbursement on either a professional claim or a facility claim. So a professional claim is also known as a CMS 1500, and that would be associated with services provided by trained professionals. And those payments are associated with um, procedures that are performed by those trained professionals. Whereas a facility claim um, or a UB04 is associated with the resources used to provide the medical care. So that um, generally ties to revenue codes um, that we'll get into a little bit more detail in a minute. And I promise I won't keep you here all day. So slide 10 at a very high level professional claims um, so again, each professional associated with the care would submit a claim for the services they provided. So for instance, if, if you're in the hospital for, for a delivery um, that, it, that, uh, of, a, of a child, you might get professional claims associated with an anesthesiologist and a different one associated with a pediatrician and a, a different one still associated with the, uh, the OBGYN providing care to the mother. Um, and these claims may span across time. So for instance, you might get um, one claim for multiple physical therapy visits. Um, and these are paid at the line level. So that means that each procedure has its own, um, own uh, whole line on that claim where the reimbursement is, is associated or the request for payment. Um, these procedures may also include a technical component or what we call a modifier, which would cover things like the supplies, equipment, or clinical staff used to deliver that procedure. 
And the um, charges that are requested on this claim um, might differ based on the setting where the care was delivered. So, you know, for instance, Medicare would pay uh, more for a procedure delivered in, uh, in, in certain settings versus in a hospital um, due to the fact that they like to split up the billing between the facility and the professional providing the service. So moving on to slide 11, at, again, at a very high level um, for a facility claim that you, you're looking for one claim for the same person on the same day at the same place. And we're gonna try to capture all the resources that were associated with the medical care at that facility. Um, and we tie those together with revenue codes, which is designed to tell us like where the care was delivered or the types of resources that were associated with the care. Um, the coding for this tends to be much more complex and a lot of the information that um, is tied to the reimbursement is in the claim header versus at the line level, like on the professional claims. Um, you know, usually the billing and coding are split up for facility claims, whereas the same person might be doing that on a professional claim. Not always, like I said, there's so many exceptions here. Um, and then on slide 12, there are plenty of examples that aren't really tied to this fee-for-service reimbursement. So examples that are common are bundled or episode payments. And again, that's, um, reimbursement that would be tied to a qualifying event, such as a healthy newborn, um, FQHC and counter payments um, aren't necessarily tied to actually what was done, uh, joint replacement, uh, dialysis. Um, so these are things where there, a qualifying event is really what drives the reimbursement versus the either the revenue codes or the, the actual procedure lines on the claim. Um, and then, of course, capitation would be a fixed payment associated with the care for a designated group of individuals. And in that case, you know, the care that was delivered um, is, is maybe an a, a, a opportunity to test how good the payment was or to reconcile the amount to take care of a population. But the payment wouldn't be associated with those actual um, requests for reimbursement. So just to wrap up here, I uh, want to let you know about some efforts that we're doing here at the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, we're in the middle of an enhanced data validation project. So uh, a medical claim that requests for payment is only really includes the amount requested by the provider. So the ultimate payments that are made or the reimbursements that are made and subsequent adjustments are actually something that we need to ask for extra um, by people who are um, paying those um, reimbursement. So um, when we ask for data to be submitted to our all payer claims database, VCURES, um, the people who are submitting that information have to give us um, some information about what was actually reimbursed. So that wouldn't be on a claim in and of itself. Um, and we are <laughs> in the process of a long overdue thorough um, validation of that reimbursement data to see how well it compares with both the records maintained by the payer for their financial transactions, but also with the provider's record. So, you know, in aggregate, how well are what we're seeing in our all payer claims database tying to what they, what these different um, parties would expect to see. So we're looking forward to, um, you know, being able to give analysts more direction about um, how to account for the um, error that we know is certainly present in this administrative data. And finally, um, as required by Act 159 of 2020, we will be producing an interactive dashboard to show some variations in reimbursement for certain services provided to Vermont residents. So once we have um, some, some um, good information about how off we think the data are, we can start doing things like this uh, with more confidence. And some reasons we expect to see differences in reimbursement are the type of payer. So you would expect that Medicare and Medicaid might pay a different, uh, reimburse a different amount than um, a commercial insurer. Um, there probably will be differences based on the provider, including those who are out of state. And again, that setting. So we already know that Medicare pays differently based on the setting the care is produced. So that initial report is slated for public release in February of 2022. So that's uh, all that we had to present for you today. I don't know if there's anything we can address before you move on to your um, fascinating discussion. Chair Mullen, would you like to see if any of the board members have questions first or should we move over to the panel? Unless a board member wants to uh, cut in, I think that the board uh, 
probably doesn't have any questions based on this presentation and we should probably hold it till after we hear from our guests today. Great. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Amarin. That was really helpful. I could uh, hear that 10 times and still not understand everything. It's very complicated. Um, so I am going to turn it over to the panelists now. Um, we have, I, I put together four or five questions that um, I shared with the panelists up front and with the board up front to get things started. Um, some of the questions are applicable to all the panelists. Some of them are only applicable to payers or providers. Um, but I would also say, um, and Chair Mellon, hopefully you're okay with this, if the board has questions as we're moving along, I would you know, certainly like them to interject if they need to, if that works for you. Um, sure, just a clarifying question, otherwise we'll uh, hold most things to the end. Okay, perfect. And I'll just ask if you're not talking, if you could just um, mute your line. Just heard a little background noise there. Um, so I will start off with the questions and um, it, as I said, not every question is for every panelist, but feel free to um, answer any of them. And Susan, you had a question? Susan Ridson? Yes, thank you. Um, okay. I just wanted to, I was under the understanding that we would each get five minutes. Okay. Yes, and I, and I was just going to say, before I go through the questions, I'm, I think I'll have each of you as I, as I, I introduced you, but if you each want to, um, if you have a few words before we go to the questions, um, that would be great. Thanks. So, uh, Susan, why don't I start with you since? <laughs> okay, sure, thank you. Uh, just for the record, I'm Susan Ridson. I'm the Executive Director of Vermont Health First Independent Practice Association. We represent 70 uh, primary care and specialty care practices across Vermont. Um, I believe Dr. Paul Rice might be on the phone as well. He's our chief medical officer and here just to chime in from the provider side. And I just wanted to say, um, or um, step back for a moment and uh, just say everybody can blame me for uh, having to be here today because uh, I'm the one who requested this meeting. And um, the request um, came from a very simple question actually, um, having to do with the payer rate review process. And there is a handout on the Green Mountain Care Board website that, that goes through um, what I'm about to talk about um, briefly. But basically, you know, we're seeing that payer rates are going up um, every year, you know, 5%, 8%, 11%, not as much for next year, which is great, um, but they're still going up. Um, so, and, you know, all of our independent practices, they are small businesses who, um, are bearing the brunt of those rate increases in the form of higher health care premiums um, for health insurance for their employees. Uh, meanwhile, you know, I'm hearing uh, um, from the clinicians in our network that reimbursement rates have been basically flat, certainly not keeping pace with the increases in costs that they're seeing. So my question to the board is, um, is the intention during the payer rate review process for independent clinicians to see a 0% increase? And when I asked Susan and, and, and Chair Mullen this question, the answer was no. So the next question I had, well, what is the follow-up process to ensure um, or at least e examine um, where, where the rate increases ultimately go? Because what we have is we're in an unsustainable situation where small businesses um, costs keep increasing year after year, um, yet their reimbursements are flat, essentially flat. It's just not a sustainable paradigm. Um, and at this point, it appears that, you know, our system is expecting these small businesses to essentially function as if we're in a free market. But Vermont's healthcare system is not a free market. And I, I was hoping that we could address this today. And my our request is simple. Create a follow-up process to see where the payer rate increases go. 
Right now it's a black box. So um, we we can get back to that when we go back to the board um, questions. Um, I certainly can, uh, I, I think I, I can open it up to the board if anyone wants to comment on that or Sarah Lindbergh or Amarin, but Kevin, it seems like you wanna wait until uh, we go through all the other panelists. I think that yeah, was- Yeah, I prefer, you know, unless it's a clarifying question that uh -huh. uh, we yep. follow the normal protocol. Okay, that sounds great. Well, and I guess then the que there is a question out there for the board um, after we ask some questions of you. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Susan. Did um, Dr. Rice wanna have any other comments or or, or, or are you good, Susan? Um, I, he may have been called away for a family okay. emergency, so if he's not chiming in, then. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So why don't we turn it over to our other provider organization today, by state Primary Care Association, and Georgia Maharis. You have a few introductory comments. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, for the record, my name is Georgia Maharis, and I'm Vice President of Policy and Strategy at Bi State Primary Care Association. We represent federally qualified health centers, Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, the Free Clinics, and AHEX in New Hampshire and Vermont. All of our members must care for patients regardless of their ability to pay, um, and they're mission driven and focused on their patients and communities. Um, and and while I know that today's conversation is about reimbursement, I also just want to take a moment to focus on people because um, that's why we're all here, I think. Um, the staff at uh, our provider practices are continuing to manage increased call volume, staffing pressures. Um, pandemic is, is no fun for anyone, right? Um, however, they're, they're continuing to, to really dig into what they can do for their patients. So for example, their dental practices remained open throughout the spring and summer. One FQHC took over a grocery store in Richford to ensure the community did not become a food desert this past June. And another opened an express care clinic with its local hospital in St. Jay. Um, for the remainder of today's conversation, I'm gonna focus on the federally qualified health centers. Um, the free clinics by nature don't get reimbursed and Planned Parenthood goes for the general um, fee schedule or negotiated rates with payers. Vermont's FQHCs serve 180,000 Vermonters, give or take, um, and they serve a high percentage of the uninsured in the state. Um, by design, as I said, that's part of the program design, 9% of our FQHC population is uninsured. Um, those figures are all from 2019. We're anticipating 2020 will be slightly higher, um, and we'll be happy to get that to you when we have it. In 2020, nine of our health centers are participating in the One Care Vermont network, um, and notably, it's all of the larger health centers that are participating. Um, and so I just wanted to say, uh, we appreciate being able to work with you at the Green Mountain Care Board, the administration, One Care payers, other provider groups, um, generally on reimbursement, but also on furthering the goals of the all-pair model and value-based payment in Vermont. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Georgia. And you don't have a question for the board at this time, it sounds like. <laughs> I do not. I may later, though. Thank you. Okay, perfect. We'll answer them. Um, so thank you. And now I will turn it over to Matt McKinnon, Senior Leader at MVP Healthcare. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, it's uh, Matt McKinnon, Senior Leader at MVP. I appreciate the invitation and uh, thank you for inviting MVP to this valuable discussion. Um, really, just in my opening remarks is just to, you know, remind everybody that MVP is a regional plan. We're based in New York and Vermont. And our goal is really to enhance our members' experience by driving value. And by doing that, it's partnering with our hospitals and physicians. Our focus is on access, population health, quality care, and then obviously being cost effective. Um, I think one of the things that MVP is has pride itself on, especially over the last few years, is recognizing that the fee-for-service model certainly is not working today. And we've actually had many different reimbursement models that are very successful, again, through value-based payment, partnering with health systems under ACOs, partnering with large physician groups on quality incentives and so forth. 
And then I think one other thing that, um, and I don't know if we'll get into the discussion today, is just a big piece, especially since COVID, access to healthcare is changing. And we've certainly invested a lot of money in telehealth. Um, in fact, promoting telehealth both to our providers and our members, because we want to make sure our members are getting the access they need. And we want one of the first plans you, to offer telehealth to all our members and all our products. And then more importantly, making sure there were no access since COVID and waiving co-pays and so forth. So I think that's going to be a little bit of today's conversation. And again, thanks for including us. Thank you, Matt. And now I'll turn it over to Andrew Garland, Vice President of Client Relations and External Affairs at Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont. Andrew? Thanks, Susan. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great. I've been having some technical difficulties here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andrew Garland. I'm the Vice President of Client Relations and External Affairs for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Uh, I've been with the plan more or less since 2001 and, and working on uh, these reimbursement challenges since uh, 2007, 2008, something like that. Uh, so I've, I've worked with a lot of you before and I appreciate today's discussion. Um, you know, I think you probably all know about Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, but just as a reminder, you know, we are a local plan. Uh, we all live and work here in Vermont. Uh, we're a non-for-profit. So all the all the dollars we're going to talk about today are our members' dollars or the community's dollars. And it is a huge part of our mission um, to make sure that not only are our members healthy, but our community are healthy as well, including all of our provider partners. Um, I don't want to repeat everything that uh, Matt just said, but um, we've been focused on a lot of the same things. As you know, we've worked with One Care Vermont uh, in support of the all-payer model um, since its inception. Uh, we also have a number of um, really exciting payment exper experiments that have moved us away from fee-for-service. Uh, almost all of them have been provider-led experiments where providers have come to us and said, hey, you know, fee-for-service is limiting our ability to practice. Uh, in this way, or it's a limiting our ability to provide access in that way, let's change the system so that we can do something better. Uh, and those pilots have been extremely ex successful and we're really excited about them. So I'm looking forward to today's, to today's discussion. I think I'm here primary to, primarily to listen, but of course I'll uh, do everything I can to answer questions for you about um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont or provider reimbursement in general. Thanks. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Alicia Cooper, Director of Payment Reform, Reimbursement and Rate Setting at the Department of Vermont Health Access. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Alicia Cooper. I work at the Department of Vermont Health Access, which is our uh, state department within the Agency of Human Services that administers our Medicaid program. Uh, I have the pleasure of working at DIVA with three different units. Uh, first, the reimbursement unit, which is responsible for some of our more traditional provider reimbursement methodologies and maintaining those over time. Uh, with our division of rate setting, which establishes rates for uh, nursing homes and for private non-medical institutions providing residential care for uh, adolescents and youth and with our payment reform unit that focuses on identifying uh, alternatives to fee-for-service reimbursement and uh, opportunities for value-based payments. Um, within DIVA and across the Agency of Human Services, uh, we have some sort of generalized reimbursement goals, uh, which include being a reliable and predictable payer partner with our um, network of providers, uh, to continually professionalize the Medicaid reimbursement methodologies that we are using to pay providers, both more traditional methodologies and uh, alternative payment models. To efficiently allocate limited resources and ensure access to cost-effective care for our Medicaid members. And to continually identify opportunities to pay for value and enable delivery system transformation. So like uh, others on the panel, I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity to join. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you all. Thanks for taking time out of your very busy days uh, to be with us today. 
So I'm going to start off the discussion with some questions. Um, as I said earlier, uh, we will turn it over to the board afterwards for their specific questions and, of course, the public. Um, but I think this would be a, this is a good way to get the conversation started. So the first question, and this is primarily for pro the provider uh, representatives, is what are the largest issues regarding reimbursement for you and your practices slash providers? And of course, the payers, uh, please, more than welcome to comment, but I think I will start with the providers. So I can call on you. Susan, you went first last time. Why don't I have Georgia go first this time? Thank you, Susan. Um, so uh, the issues regarding reimbursement that I would categorize as looming large for our FQHCs are directly correlated to their designation as federally qualified health centers. Um, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, they're heavily regulated by the Bureau of Primary Health Care, um, which is within HRSA, within HHS. Their oversight includes compliance. So, for example, only the board can hire and fire the CEO. The board must um, be 51% or more patients. HRSA, the Bureau, defines quality measures. Um, they also define financial metrics, so they have to offer sliding fee scale discounts that are reviewed and approved by the Bureau. Uh, they also uh, regulate the services they offer, so they have to provide certain services, and they can't just stop or start services um, without federal approval, for example, dental. And they also have to meet certain clinical staffing requirements. Um, so all told, they comply with over 90 requirements that are evaluated through written reports, operational site visits, and they have to apply to continue their certification every three years. Um, most importantly, unlike some other provider types, they must accept all patients, regardless of the ability to pay, as a condition of being a federally qualified health center. The program was specifically designed to serve underserved communities and ensure that they, those patients have access to cost-effective primary and preventive care. So within this framework, FQHCs are reimbursed in, in a few different ways, depending on the payer type. So for commercial payers, generally, it's the physician fee schedule or a negotiated fee schedule. Um, you know, I, I can say that I think in Vermont, um, all our health centers get the Blue Cross um, physician fee schedule. For a subset of commercial, the commercial market, the exchange or marketplace population, um, the Affordable, Affordable Care Act requires that those carriers pay the PPS rate, that is the same rate that Medicaid pays to federally qualified health centers. And finally, for Medicare and Medicaid, um, they have either a prospective payment system, which Sarah Lindbergh uh, referenced, or an alternative payment model, different than the alternative payment model we have negotiated. So same acronym, unfortunately. Um, the PPS for Medicaid and Medicare covers the majority of claims that they process, but not all of them. For example, labs are billed separately and according to a fee schedule. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on the third because it directly relates to the issue I'm going to raise. Um, in 2000, uh, the Medicare, Medicaid, and SHIP Benefits Improvement and Protection Act, BIPA, was signed into law. This established a minimum Medicaid per visit rate for FQHCs, the PPS. And it was offered with annual growth inflators, the Medicare Economic Index. So annually, this MEI has varied between about 0.8% and just under 2%, well below rising costs, as Susan Risden noted earlier. Um, this law was passed to ensure that Medicaid paid appropriately for services and to avoid health centers using federal grants to subsidize the Medicaid program. So that federal law is still in place. And because of it, FQHCs are extremely limited in what services they can take risk for from a reimbursement perspective. So given this complex federal framework, the issues um, with reimbursement um, predominantly revolve around administrative burden. So health centers are held to many masters including the Bureau of Primary Health Care. And to give some context, the Bureau of Primary Health Care covers 30 million patients a year. And um, it is not likely that they are going to shift to go to what a local payer would do, right? That's, that's a, hard, a hard negotiation for any health center to be in. Along with the reimbursement regime is a quality measure 
um, alignment. And so unfortunately, the quality measures are not completely aligned with those in the all-pair model. So multiple quality measures being tracked simultaneously. So an opportunity that we would offer would be to more tightly align quality measures that correlate to reimbursement and reduce the number of goals that FQHCs and other primary care practices have to meet each year. Um, I'm sure you know it's hard to have 100 number one priorities. Another reimbursement concern we have is around the area of telehealth. Um, so the pandemic has brought us many things, including uh, significantly more uptake in this newer service modality. Um, for Medicare specifically, FQHCs and also rural health clinics, um, we're not allowed to bill as distance site providers. And so under the pandemic, they are allowed to, to use this modality and bill to Medicare. But it's not clear where this is going to end up after the public health emergency ends. So it's um, just another area and a wrinkle in the reimbursement world. So I will pause there with uh, the two issues that, that are floating to the top today. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Georgia. And Susan Ritzen, you go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my answer is much simpler. Um, <laughs> Our largest issue is continually rising costs without associated increases in income. You know, for independent practices, they have one source of income, reimbursements from payers. Um, and individual practices, you know, essentially have little or no uh, ability to negotiate those rates. That's the problem. And uh, I see Dr. Rice has been able to join us. If you want to add to that, please do, from the pay practice perspective. Yes, thank you so much. And sorry to be late. I have a family health emergency going on. Um, <clears throat> but um, I, I guess the main thing in, in terms of that that we're learning lately is that the payers are are actually being being uh, not only encouraged but made to in some you know strong ways put their additional funds into one care uh, then to be paid out to us. So if we're not participating in one care uh, be, because we're not all on board with the way they're moving along with things, um, we, we we get no increases. They're basically telling us, or they're basically telling us, if you want any more fee increases or any any more payment for your services, you have to get them through One Care. Um, to the point where even if we wanted to do a uh, innovative model directly with a payer separately, they uh, they will not do that. Any any uh, innovative models or any um, alternative payment models have to go through one care. So, so we're sort of stuck um, and uh, have no ability to act as if it's a sort of a free market um, to negotiate with, uh, with equals. That's the unfortunate situation that we're in. Um, we, don't, we don't really have any, uh, any, any ability to negotiate whatsoever. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so I'm sure we'll have follow-ups on that that point you just made, Dr. Rice, and and um, ha I hadn't heard that before. So so we'll look into that. Um, and um, I don't know if any of the payers want to comment on this question. Uh, if not, I can move to the next one. And, you, and don't feel like you have to. Uh, this is Matt McKenna from MVP. Uh, just the one thing I want to add when we talk about um, issues regarding reimbursement. Um, for a lot of us payers that we're in, um, you know, we're in a, a mix of different products, we're also at risk with the regulatory agencies that we cover the membership. So the challenges that we face is, you know, when there's you know cuts just across the board uh, from Medicare or Medicaid, and how do, how does that impact? Uh, MVP has always been um, in at-risk uh, plans. And as part of that, you know, we work with our provider community, again, access to quality care, making sure everything's accurately coded in the charts and so forth. So it's a challenge from the payer side too, to uh, justify uh, the services that we've uh, paid for. Great, thank you, Matt. Anyone else? Okay, so, now I'll ask, I think this could be for everybody, how has your practice providers or your, um, as a payer, how have you um, adapted reimbursement strategies to value-based care? Um, 
I think I can open this up to everybody. I think this is this could be very long winded, <laughs> but I but what I'm trying to get at is how is everyone looking forward? Um, we know that uh, from the where Medicare is at the federal level that um, you know value based care isn't going away. In fact, I'm I'm certain it will probably ramp up even even further in the next four years. So. Um, I'll just open this question up to the group. Um, I see Paul, Dr. Rice, you have a, your hand up. Yeah, yes, only if, if you could help us out with that because it's yeah. a catch term, this value-based care. Mm -hmm. it'd, be, it'd be helpful to, to have you have us understand what you mean by it. Um, if we're providing fee for service at low cost, you know, everybody knows about the, you know, the value equation is, is, uh, is quality over cost. Um, so fee for service is real high value if it's low cost and high quality. Um, so it'd be helpful for us to know what you mean by value-based care. If you're purely talking about prepaid care, maybe we should talk about capitation um, mm -hmm. if that's what really we're talking about. No, thank you for that question, Dr. Rice. It's a good one. You know, uh, I would um, look at this and, and uh, other board, the other board members, members of the board can chime in here, but I'm, I'm looking at it in terms of our reform efforts within the state and where we're going with the all payer model. And so, um, yes, I, I, I agree with you not, and even in that model, not everything is going to be in a fixed payment. Um, and if, it, you know, if we do have high quality, low cost fee for service areas for, for certain things that are appropriate for fee for service, um, I, that, that works. But that's what I was envisioning when I put this question out there. So I would say in our, in our Vermont, uh, movement towards value-based care and fixed payments. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Uh, Susan, Susan, this is Georgia. I'm happy to happy to offer uh, our uh, briefer than before <laughs> response to this question. Um, so uh, FQHCs have long been eager participants in patient-centered medical homes. So you know, I consider that part of our history in value-based care as we continue moving forward. And currently all of them are certified as PCMHs. Um, at this time, they do not get fixed payments from one care or any payer, um, but we're eager to continue the discussion. We actually had a really great conversation just this past Monday with one care and some consultants from HMA. Um, so I think, you know, there's uh, definitely some nice opportunities and some nice things that we can learn from other states in this area. Thank you. Great. That's helpful. Anybody else want to comment on this? Add any update to that? I'll, I'll comment. Um, so just, just looking at across our network, um, you know, uh, there's actually not a huge percentage of reimbursement coming in as value-based payments, maybe 5% um, for those practices who are in the normal one care program. For those who are in the CPR program, um, which we do have a couple of our primary care practices, um, perhaps up to 30% um, of their patient panel or reimbursements, and Rick might be able to chime in or Paul um, to correct me if I got that wrong. Um, would be associated with value-based or fixed payments, um, which is far below the estimated 63 to 65% needed to actually change, um, you know, patient strategy or reimbursement, um, change the way the practice does business. Um, the other issue that we have in our network is there really is no program for specialists. So there's no value-based payments or fixed payments available to them. So at this juncture, um, although you know the majority of our practices do continue to participate in the healthcare mm -hmm. reform efforts through One Care, um, it's it's not at a level that is changing practice behavior. Great, thank you. That's that's great feedback. Thank you, Susan. Anybody else? Any of the payers want to comment? 
from your your strategies. I'm sure you've. Yeah. Susan, this is Andy Garland from Blue Cross. I'm, yes. I'm happy to come. Um, I'll try not to go on too long about this. Um, you know, we've been working with providers in Vermont on value-based care, frankly, before value-based care was even a term that had any currency, you know, going back 25 plus years, um, we had phenomenal partnerships with physician and hospital organizations across the state where we collaborated on uh, quality programming, uh, access to care programming, um, care, care management, and what we would today call care coordination. Um, and as those, you know, programs sunsetted, uh, we immediately turned our attention to, um, you know, all the work that, that came out of our initial focus um, in, in Green Mountain Care, um, you know, collaborating with uh, oh. uh, the director of payment reform uh, to pilot value-based care initiatives across the state. And then, of course, we transitioned in um, to the all-payer model um, program with everybody else and have been big supporters of that from the beginning. Uh, we partnered with all three ACOs. Uh, that that were initially a part of of the all payer model and uh, have worked really hard with OneCare uh, since then to build support for that program across the state. We we um, have retooled our claims processing engine uh, to support the prospective payment system and to automate uh, really complex <laughs> complex work like our our attribution, our statewide attribution, uh, our support for the uh, blueprint for health. Um, and we've continued to experiment with really exciting value-based payment initiatives, either underneath um, the all-payer model umbrella or in support of the all-payer model. Uh, so we've we've piloted a number of, of great programs with uh, provider types who have not yet joined the all-payer model, but are um, rowing in that same direction. And we work with them, you know, to help build sort of a quality focus that aligns um, with the state's priorities. And as I said earlier, to find those barriers in the fee-for-service reimbursement system um, and remove them from them. So we have, for example, a really exciting program with uh, mental health providers who told us that they wanted tools to improve uh, the outcomes that they were getting from therapy sessions. Um, we sat down with them and understood how fee-for-service was limiting their ability to pursue those tools. Um, we made a change, and as a result of that, we've seen unbelievable results in uh, avoided uh, ER and, uh, and inpatient stays related to mental health crisis. It's, it's been a phenomenally effective um, program. We have similar programs uh, with uh, visiting nurses. We have a really exciting program with the University of Vermont Health Network, and all of those have been based on uh, clinical leaders coming to us and saying, hey, we have an opportunity to improve the care that we're providing to your members if you can help us change this aspect of fee-for-service that's holding us back. And we continue to look for those those opportunities wherever uh, wherever they occur. Great. Thank you. That's helpful to hear. Anyone else? So this is uh, Paul Rice again. I guess I... I might um, just add to what Susan said in that even though there's fixed payments going to uh, one care and the hospitals from one care, um, the real question is how are those being, how are you turning that into value within those, uh, within the various systems? Are the, are the physicians, uh, for example, or other healthcare practitioners who are actually making the decisions about whether, do, are they being, are they being, uh, um, incentivized to to uh, you know provide only the highest value care um, or are they still being incentivized based on RVUs and total volume um, I guess that's the real question um, so uh, is is it going to really uh, meet our, our our directives if, if it's not being applied within a large organization as uh, as the way it's intended um, j just just throwing that out there yeah, yeah thank you I hear you um, Alicia, I think you were going to chime in as well. Yes, thank you. Just a, a few additional thoughts from the, the Medicaid perspective. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, DIVA has had a priority of moving more of its payments away from fee-for-service reimbursement methodologies and toward uh, alternative methodologies for payment. Um, we have been working with OneCare now for several years 
implementing the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program. Uh, this is our largest alternative payment model that we have implemented to date, and it has given um, the DIVA team a uh, platform for Medicaid innovation within the broader context of the Vermont all-payer model. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do through this program is increase the proportion of Medicaid funds that are distributed in these fixed prospective payment arrangements. Um, increasingly over time in each of the years that we've had for the, the contract with OneCare. And it has also given us an opportunity to learn how payment and delivery system reform can result in uh, different types of health, health outcomes. Um, we've seen some promising quality results from our most recent year of the contract. And so we're, we're anxious to continue the model to understand um, some of what its potential is. Beyond ACO-based reform, however, uh, I mentioned that DIVA has a payment reform unit. The payment reform unit works across the Agency of Human Services and its departments on various cross-agency payment model design and implementation efforts. Um, we try to integrate Medicaid payment and delivery system reform across the care continuum in this way uh, using of a standard approach to developing payment models and then implementing alternative payment structures, um, regardless of which department in the Agency of Human Services we're working with or which uh, subset of providers we're working with. And this also has given us the opportunity uh, as we think about ourselves as the broader Medicaid program within the Agency of Human Services to align the core concepts of um, value-based payment models that have Samuel, started go get in our uh, ACO contract uh, with some of these newer models that are being implemented. Um, and so I think we're continuing to uh, have that commitment to alternative payment models and to moving away from fee-for-service reimbursement in the future, um, whether that's through ACO-based reform or through alternative models that uh, relate more specifically to other types of services or providers that interact broadly with the Agency of Human Services and its department. Terrific. Thank you, Alicia. And I'll just remind folks, if you're not speaking, if you could put yourselves on mute. I just heard a little background noise. Um, anybody else who hasn't commented? Um, if not, I'll move on to the next question. Okay. Um, and I'm mindful of the time. I want to make sure that we do have an opportunity for uh, additional board questions and the public comment. So um, I'm going to com combine two of the questions. Um, first, uh, many of you folks, all of you folks actually touched on this issue uh, in your introductions, and that's COVID-19. Um, I'm looking at the wording of the question that I sent out and I, I, I put COVID-19 in the past tense, which it absolutely is not, as we can tell from uh, what's happening uh, throughout the country and even here in Vermont with the latest surge. So I, I, I would rephrase the question and say, how is COVID-19 impacting your practice and your providers and your, um, your coverage uh, as a payer? And then, um, thinking about what what has been beneficial in um, throughout the pandemic um, in terms of either uh, payment models, I, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, some of the fixed payments from um, the all payer model and the ACO that got some of the independent practices by, I know they weren't all their payments, but it was something that was um, definitely predictable and sustainable during that time. Um, and then Georgia talked about like the telehealth um, issues that they're fine now, but you know we'll see what happens when we come out on the other side. So um, why don't we start with um, a payer this time? Why don't we start with Andrew? Uh, if you wanna share first and we'll go back through the line. Sure. Um and I'm sorry, I'm not as expert at this particular topic as other people in our organization. But, you know, what I would say is that since we, you know, the moment we became aware of, um, you know, the potential impacts of, of COVID-19, our focus has all been on access. 
So we, we knew that this was really going to be disruptive to our members, to our provider partners, uh, to our clients, right? All the, the businesses who, um, you know, who work with us. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had our sites firmly fixed on the things that we can do to make it easier for folks who need care to access care. Um, that, that's included, obviously, a huge ramp up in telemedicine, um, both the service that, that we provide and also in partnership with a lot of our, our provider partners who have um, stood up their own telemedicine uh, capabilities. Um, it's included looking at um, benefit, you know, cost shares, uh, uh, medical policies, and really finding anything that we could do um, to make it easier for, for people to get care during this time. Um, we also were very cognizant that, you know, the state is in the middle of this extremely important um, program with uh, CMMI. We, um, we've put so much hard work into building uh, the all-payer model framework and really um, getting the, the momentum of, of our community behind that transformative work. And we didn't want to see that slip away either. Uh, so we spent a lot of time with our partners at OneCare talking about how we keep the model going. Um, you probably know that we spent a lot of time over the last couple of years working with large organizations across the state um, to help them understand what the all-payer model is about and why um, it's beneficial for all of us to be participating, you know, throwing our support behind that transformation. And we really didn't want to see that slip away uh, during COVID um, because we've accomplished so much. So, so that's what, what we focused on. And of course, um, we've, we've had a lot of conversations uh, with, with providers across the state about what they need and uh, what we can do to help support them during this time. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Now, um, Matt, do you want to comment on this question? Yeah, I, have, I obviously would have some similar responses as Andrew had, um, you know, supporting one care and so forth. But just one other thing to touch base on. You know, access was the crucial piece, and not only as far as developing the telehealth, but also working with our members. Uh, not all members, you know, have phones with video capabilities. So was audio going to work, and how could we work with the members? And then also, as, as, as the months continued in this COVID, working with our partners to establish, you know, which members are being treated, which members aren't. How can we also help with member education or provide rosters to our providers to say, these are the members that still need to get in or haven't been able to get in and how can we coordinate? So just kind of adding to Andrew's comments, but with the, with also the focus on, you know, how can we help the members too directly? Great, thank you. And Alicia, do you have any comments or statements think, on this question? I think a lot of similar themes to those that have just been mentioned. Um, I'll also just of note that if anyone's curious about the full complement of activities that the Medicaid program has been uh, trying to undertake in response to COVID-19, we have a, a great website that summarizes all of the different things um, that have been part of the conversation, including uh, ramping up some of the, the telehealth um, access and availability, um, waiving some of our prior authorization requirements to ensure that there aren't any barriers to care, um, things like uh, ensuring that there's continuous eligibility for Medicaid members. We're not uh, redetermining eligibility for any Medicaid members at this time. There's been elimination of certain uh, cost sharing requirements. Um, and in addition to that, the Agency of Human Services has been working closely with the state on the implementation of a number of healthcare stabilization grant programs. So we're trying to help how we can um, in making some of the state's coronavirus relief funds available to the provider network at large. Perfect. And you uh, can post that website. If you want to send us the link, we can put that in our um, notes from today's meeting if you'd like that on our website. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so I'm trying to be equitable here. I forgot which order I was in between Georgia and Susan. So um, why don't I just turn to Georgia first? It, 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 was that right? Doesn't matter to me, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you. I, I touched on some of the, the impacts yeah. earlier. Um, and I do want to pick up the, the theme that 
uh, my colleagues represented, um, you know, don't delay care. Uh, it, it's, it's still a challenge. Immunizations, child well visits, getting back on track with lab draws. So um, it takes more than a village on that one. Um, so uh, thank you to the payers for pushing that and everyone else who has, who has a mouthpiece to do so. Um, you know, in terms of things that have been beneficial, I, I have the benefit of working in New Hampshire and Vermont, um, and there's been a lot of amazing communication in both states. Um, but, you know, the, the frequency of conversation in Vermont um, has been really well appreciated. Um, that said, I think all of us are still drinking from a fire hose with all the information. Where are the rumors? Where are the truths? So anything to, to mitigate that is always helpful from anyone. Um, and then the final piece is around workforce. I touched on this briefly in the beginning, um, but our staffing is not up to pre-COVID levels. You know, staff are out for, um, you know, because they've got children who are virtually learning. Staff are out because they have to quarantine, um, you know, and, and it's gonna be a challenge for a while. And I also think that across our state, we probably have a lot of folks who have just left their jobs forever in the healthcare sector, be it in the dental hygienists or, you know, other other folks who are front lines or folks who are close to retirement who've chosen to to step off that treadmill. Um, so I think that you know, moving forward through the rest of the pandemic, really making sure we have the people to take care of our people, our patients, and our residents will be really important. Um, and again, appreciating the work the Green Mountain Care Board has done, leading. Um, a lot of those efforts, um, I, you know, it seems like there's uh, a lot of opportunity in that area. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And Susan. I, I would echo a lot of the points that Georgia has made. Um, in addition, I'll just mention um, definitely the telehealth um, coverage at parity for both audio, um, audio visual and audio only has has been and will continue to be really key. Um, uh, for the independent practices, the Paycheck Protection Program also basically, I think, uh, is a primary reason why our practices are still open. Um, of course, the, the funds through AHS did help a number of our practices as well. Um, so, but it um, it's still a tough time, tough time for folks. Um, and our, our workforce is getting extremely tired. And I'm sure Paul um, can chime in on this uh, more personally. Yeah, if I if I could, I I, um, I guess the one thing, and I'm sorry, I was on on taking care of family health care there, so I didn't hear everybody's comments. But um, one of the things is it's extremely inefficient to take care of patients now during this pandemic. Um, you know, using the waiting, you know, using the parking lot as a waiting room, for example, rather than your own and, and, and having so much more staff that has to call ahead and do screening and it's very inefficient. Um, and so uh, there's some going to be some deferred care um, and a real backup of the ability of uh, people to get in in for care. Um, and we're, we're already seeing that um, we're trying to do our best to get people who are sick into the office rather than having them go to the ER. Uh, but it's, um, I guess that's my point, is a very inefficient. Um, and any any model that that, that would, would include sort of more substantial management fees for primary care that covers, you know, telehealth, um, yeah. rather than having it be fee-for-service and cover all the phone calls that are necessary that you don't want to have to submit a bill for every time. And um, those kind of thing, a substantial management fee to cover all those non-fee-for-service uh, components that go into care would would be something that we really should look forward to. It, it, it's it's not the complete capitation because we will never move to that. Um, we just can't in primary care. Everybody does things differently. But uh, but there's some good middle ground probably that we can come up with that uh, supports primary care that's not, not so uh, mm, elaborate or complicated that it's cost more to apply than 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 you really than you really should, if that makes sense. That's helpful. Um, thank you, and I will apologize up front for the barking dogs. I think um, that's that's super helpful, um, all of you. Thank you for your uh, answers to these questions. I think 
I'll turn it back to Chair Mullen and the board members at this time. Um, I think this is a good uh, opportunity to see if they have any other questions, and then I can go on mute for the duck barking dogs. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Great job moderating, and I'll relieve you from the barking dogs. And uh, we'll start the uh, board questioning this afternoon in reverse alphabetical order, starting with the letter L, to really throw everybody for a loop. So that will be board member Robin Lund. Thank you. I never get to start because I'm right in the middle, so that's fun for a change. Um, yeah, so I had a couple of follow-up questions. Um, related to some of the discussion. Um, I think I'll start actually with a question for Georgia. Um, Georgia, you mentioned some of the federal limitations on taking risk and um, looking at how some other states are handling that. I'm wondering if you could just expound on that a little bit and also talk about um, if there's any activities that you would recommend or that you're participating in on the federal level that might move that conversation along. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to answer by using an analogy that I am borrowing from Dr. Art Jones, who is um, CMO of an, ACE, of an FQHC dominated ACO in the Chicago area. So the way he explains um, the what you can take risk on as an FQHC is with a birthday cake. Um, so the cake part of the cake is the PPS, and you can't take risk on the cake part of the cake. The frosting is all the other payments that you could take risk on. So in the Vermont market, it could be care coordination payments that are above and beyond the PPS rate. It could be a specific um, substance use disorder program that you're operating. Um, it could even be dental theoretically. Um, so it's the, the services that are outside of the, the basic encounter type services. Um, so then looking to, to what those opportunities are, um, there's been some really great work in Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Illinois, um, and a, a touch in Maryland to, to really focus in on this this frosting um, and how you can look at that. Um, so, you know, I think, as I mentioned, we had this good conversation earlier this week with One Care. I would love more conversations along those lines. Um, I, I perhaps shouldn't go as far as to say we should have meetings periodically with stakeholders so we're all learning at the same time. Um, I think everyone, including myself, is scarred from some of the robustness of the SIM meetings, but um, that might be a step we want to take, for example, to have a, a joint learning opportunity in this area. Um, and then uh, in terms of, you know, what opportunities exist on the federal level, um, we at Bi State uh, are privileged to have a longstanding good relationship with the Bureau of Primary Health Care, the regulator of the federally qualified health centers. Um, and right now, the Bureau is in the process of revising how some of its oversight of health centers is going to happen moving forward. It's REACH, R-E-A-C-H. And they're looking to launch that somewhere between 2022 and 2025. <laughs> we'll see exactly when that launches. Um, and so we, anyone really, that have an opportunity to weigh in on the pieces and parts of that. Um, all of that said, that's, you know, you can modify some of the quality measures. You could modify potentially some of the compliance obligations. Um, but, you know, there's an underlying federal law that Congress passed, right? So that is directing HRSA to behave in a certain way um, with this program. And there's a uh, very strong sense of making sure taxpayer dollars are well spent at the federal level and that this designation is really honored um, in that way. So, Happy to explore various things as as they come along. Um, as I as I mentioned, I think quality the quality alignment could be a really great area because that could reduce a lot of tension potentially for everyone, um, and also help get towards some of our goals um, in the all peer model. Does that get to your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I I did want to turn to Susan Risden next um, to talk with you a little bit about your ask, because to be frank, it doesn't make sense. Um, so 
what I think you are suggesting um, sort of misses the point that a, a, a rate, a premium rate review process is about ensuring a, is basically a projection. So it, it's not a guarantee that the tr medical trend will be in that ballpark. It's not a cap. It is literally just a projection based on data from two years prior claims data. So it is trued up with reality um, in terms of what actually happens. Uh, but it's not meant to be a rate setting or other, like a provider rate setting or to direct provider reimbursements. So uh, the part that I find particularly confusing, to be frank, is that I'm assuming that if we use the statistics that our staff provided around our regulatory authority, which is 15% of the commercial market, the other 85% is self-insured employers, uh, I'm assuming that you know, your payer mix and your practices may be different. We don't know. We don't have that data. Um, so I guess my question is um, how, if we are only looking at 15% of the, the premiums, we're only looking at 15% of the commercial population. So um, do you have different reimbursement schedules for the other 85%? How many fee schedules do your practices have? What is your payer mix? What can you tell us about margins, days cash? You know, these are all pieces of information that would be helpful in trying to be more directive around reimbursement. But I don't think personally that the rate review process is the sensible place to go there. So um, I guess if you could explain your thinking a little bit more, that would be really helpful. So to me, it, it's a bigger issue um, or a big, bigger picture to look at. Um, you know, we're, I am assuming that, or presuming that the the medical trend that's based on claims data includes data from independent clinicians. Yet, um, and and that data is used to you know justify a rate increase. And I understand that the rate increase is not an indication of provider reimbursement, but it seems to me that. Um, you know, it's unsustainable if you're increasing rates, you're including independent data in, in the rate increase or the rate review process, but yet there's no follow-up to see if uh, where it goes on the other end. And I'm hearing from our clinicians that things haven't changed and it's not sustainable. Robin, can I clarify one question you brought up was sure. um, whether we have different fee schedules. We we don't. So that 15% that 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 you're getting a fee schedule increase based on all those third party payers, um, the payers are, are third party administrators uh, work that uh, the payers are doing. Uh, we we get one fee schedule. There's no difference between whether it's uh, an, based on an approved rate or whether it's being paid for on behalf of a, a, a third party self-insured employer. Um, so in essence, whatever whatever they're using to to come up with that rate increase, it's it, it goes across the board. It well, applies. Presumably, to you have more than one payer that you're operating, right? Yes, more than one payer, but within that payer, it's a single fee, uh, regardless of whether the employer is paying the bill versus the insurer paying the bill as an in a fully insured patient. Does that help? Uh, it does, um, although it actually makes me more concerned about doing something or trying to do something in rate review, because quite frankly, it w could very well result with you having additional fee schedules, because our regular authority regulatory authority does not ex go beyond those that 15 percent so uh, I, th I think I, the way to attack it is more on a provider rate setting model which quite frankly on the fee for service level is very complex and and i'm not sure uh i mean i think you guys have to think carefully about whether you want to be regulated i guess what i'm really asking more we're really asking more is is if the question can be asked so when a a, a rate you know proposal comes for for an increase of 10 you know, let's say 10 percent um that the question can be asked is you know how much is this going to providers and is it going to providers in a fair and equitable way yes 
Right, but the question doesn't make sense in the context of rate review because the question that uh, we are trying to answer is what are we assuming medical trend might be going forward? So because we cap for provider reimbursement in the form of charges in the hospital budget process, we can we can ask, show us your work where you've taken our provide our regulated cap and that that is included in your assumptions. But um, I think it's the the question to me, like we're not operating at a line level. And so uh, unless we regulate the other entity, the the data just doesn't it just doesn't work in that process. Okay, that's that's helpful. I guess the question would be if 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 the Green on Care Board doesn't have the ability to work within the line level, who does? And um, because it's a huge problem within our system currently. So then and who does it fall under to uh, um, because obviously we have some major forces within our current system, like it or not, that drive things not based on a free market system, um, but yet the independent practices, it seems we are allowed to sort of float out there as if we're in a free market system. Um, but there's nothing to help us <laughs> on uh, on the other side regulating the non-free market parts of the system. Um, and so I, we, we just put that out there for consideration of, you know, if the Greenmount Care Board doesn't do it, maybe there is some other means or mechanism um, to allow that uh, to be looked at or at least regulated in a way that allows there to be some fairness and mm, uh, mm, reasonableness and uh, <laughs> I don't know, it, within and equity uh, to some extent within within the system because we don't we don't really have it now. And to me, the way to regulate that is to regulate at the provider level. Like that would be the mechanism to do it, which would mean we would need to collect data from independent providers similar to the data that we collect in the hospital budget process. I thought you said you're not looking at the actual payments to providers with the fees to providers saying, within the um, hospital budget. We set a cap on charges in the hospital budget process. So that is the process that we do look at fees. We don't look at it outside of the hospital because we don't regulate those providers. So our mechanism for doing it would be to regulate those providers, which would require substantial information gathering from whichever provider type we were regulating. So, I mean, I think that, which, you know, we certainly hear from the hospitals that that's not a, a light ask. Yeah, it's something I think we would be willing to consider. Um, we we would put our fees out there with what we're, be, you know, in terms of what we're being charging and what we're paying being paid. Yeah, but what we would need to look at is not just your fees, but also your financial structure of your organization, your payer mix, your day's cash on hand, your margins, those sorts of other metrics that we look at. But in any case, it's it's a larger discussion. It would require, you know, quite frankly, more staffing and and uh, it's not a, a light ask on your end or our end. But to me, it's like if we're going to get into regulating um, provider reimbursement, the only way to really do that without running into ERISA problems, among others, is at the provider level. Yeah, I, I just, it's not to prolong it, but I, I would wonder if the Green Mountain Care Board has the ability just to say, you can't charge more than 250% of Medicare. And, and, How do and, I know 250% of Medicare is the right level? That's why I need data. Well, I, yeah, right. I, I, I hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Kevin, I will uh, leave it at that because I've probably taken up more than my time. So, so before we go to uh, Jess, if I could just ask a follow-up of Dr. Rice from what uh, Robin's questions were asking. Paul, I know you can't talk um, because the contracts probably don't allow you about specific reimbursement, but I'm curious what the variation is between um, the commercial payers. You know, I'm sure that you're dealing with um, – the entities that we get to at least look at uh, here in Vermont, such as Blue Cross, MVP, and Cigna, but also um, you're probably dealing with Aetna and, and others. And so I'm just curious, what's the variation in your reimbursement from those commercial payers? 
Yes, thank you. It, it's actually, you know, I can answer what they're based on rather than actually the fees, but there is some substantial differences. Um, and I think, uh, you, you know, for example, I can say that for MVP, we're paid on a percentage of Medicare. Okay, so it's pretty straight. It's easy. You know what it's going to be. It's easy to change by just saying we're going to increase it by, you know, we're going to keep it attached to Medicare as a percentage. Um, uh, uh, Blue Cross, on the other hand, all over the map. Um, it has no rhyme or reason based on Medicare or RVUs. Um, and so it's really hard to understand, and it's even harder to understand how, how you how you change that from year to year. So um, there can be tremendous variation, especially in the non-evaluation and management fees, in other words, the procedural fees, from payer to payer, 100% um, difference, uh, or, you know, 200% difference. Uh, no, that's not, no, two times, 100% difference, um, it can occur, especially uh, uh, in those non-ENMs. Uh, within the ENMs, there's there there is pretty substantial variation as well. Thank you. So with that I'll turn to Board Member Holmes. Jess. Great. Um, thank you. Interesting uh, conversation as always. Always learn a lot. Um, I guess one of the things I would love to talk about is um, so it seems like we're hearing a little bit about fair and equitable reimbursement and. In a survey that we did of providers, independent providers, a few years ago, the independent providers reported that actually uncertainty of income was much more concerning than the level of income. And in fact, some other data that we had suggested that independent providers actually uh, earn higher incomes than hospital employed providers. So it was the uncertainty that was a challenge uh, among our independent providers in Vermont. And so I guess one of the questions I had is why isn't there greater interest in joining uh, One Care Vermont CPR program, where there is this, you know, it's capitated, it's a stable revenue flow. Why isn't, if, if one of the concerns or their larger concern is uncertainty rather than level, why not um, join in a payment model that guarantees stability? And maybe I can go to Susan, I guess that would maybe be the best person there. Um, and I, I will look to Paul as well because they made the choice not to join One Care, but I. I can tell you that um, it does not work for every practice. It really depends on the practice model, whether or not it's beneficial. Um, some practices would actually lose money in that model. Um, and as I stated before, it's um, you know it's a small percentage of the total um, patient panel. So it's really not enough to change practice behavior, but by and large, our practices are interested in um, novel payment methods. Um, yeah, yeah, I can, I can add to that and, and say that uh, that's exactly true for our practice. We did, when it was offered to us, uh, the fully capitated model, we did the numbers and we have a different style of practices practice than others. We actually have a high um, frequency of visit in our practice. We get people in the same day. Um, our primary care visits, some of the payers have said, oh, you see your patients too much, um, that your your visit uh, encounters are higher than the average for primary care. I said, well, isn't that what you want? Um, we, we do a lot of orthopedics in the office. We do a lot of procedures. We actually send fewer people out to specialists. So yes, we have a very high um, specialty sort of care within primary care, and you get penalized for that in the program that they are offering. Um, it, it more incentivizes you to send folks out to, to specialty care rather than keep them in your own practice and see them yourself. And um, so we do a lot of outreach and get people into the practice. You know, we don't do phone refills, for example, at the annual uh, need. Uh, we say, oh, your meds are out. You need to come in and see us. Um, and so we uh, we provide that level. I guess the other 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 thing is that um, um, the uh, the amount that was being offered is is generally it should be for primary care you should be able to say oh that's a good amount you know that sounds like a good program and that's absolutely not clear for what 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 they're offering um, so uh, if it was good we would take it absolutely if it was good support for primary care there's no reason we wouldn't take it um, and actually I was wondering if um, if Andrew and Matt might be able to respond to um, Dr. Rice's earlier comment about the only way to get reimbursement increases or opportunities for innovation is through One Care. So I, I didn't quite hear a response to that from the payers, and I'm wondering if there's some conversation we could have about that or hear about that. 
Sure. This is Andrew. I'm trying to get my camera back on. It doesn't seem to be. Oh, there we go. Um, well, so uh, I think I understand where the comment is coming from. Um, it's not. It's not entirely accurate. Um, we we do have um, physician fee schedule increases built into our budget each year. I understand completely that they are not as much um, or they're not as high as anyone would like. Um, I think it's fair to say that we receive feedback from virtually every provider type and in, in a given year um, that they believe that that their reimbursement should be increased. Um, you know, it's, it's not only stress on independent providers. Um, you know, we get we get we hear from most providers of you know, hospitals, uh, physicians, specialists, you know, PT practices, chiro practices, DME providers. Um, that, that they feel like a reimbursement need, uh, increase is needed. Um, so that said, we, we do increase uh, reimbursement annually, and, and we have for at least the last decade or so. And there, there have been times, you know, in my work with Blue Cross where that hasn't been the case, where we've had to skip an increase for a year or two, but that hasn't happened lately. That said, what has happened lately um, is that we have disproportionately uh, shifted um, those increases to providers who are participating in in One Care Vermont, and that's really been in the form of um, value-based payment to support uh, the transformation that those providers have have committed to make. So um, more dollars are are going through that model. Um, you know, it is it is the most important you know reform effort that we have going on in Vermont, and I know that those practices who are a part of it have um, committed to a huge undertaking, uh, you know, in, in addition to dealing with all of those sort of day in, day out stresses that, that Dr. Rice was describing, they have to also find, you know, the time and resources um, to reorganize the way they provide care. Um, so so that's, that's the reason um, that we made that choice. And I, I think it's very in keeping with what really we've been working on, you know, for, for the last decade since we started uh, the blueprint for health um, and really, really recognizing that, you know, that transforming care is a complicated and, and costly effort uh, and people are, are doing it off the sides of their desks and need help. Thank you. Really helpful, Andrew. I don't know if Matt, you had anything to add to that. But. Uh, similar comments to uh, Andrew, as far as the uh, investment in one care value-based type arrangements. And then just to reiterate what Dr. Reese said earlier, um, MVP, we do we do use CMS as our basis because we think it's just more transparent um, if we base it off CMS and we can um, you know, look to adopt um, their their code set, their values, and so forth. So I think that's you know certainly more beneficial for the providers and easier to understand. Yeah, helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess my other question was really, it's always so challenging to think about what is, how do you define fair and equitable and, and all of that. So I guess, um, and one of the, one of the things I think Robin brought up was payer mix. And so, you know, one of the things we know about commercial reimbursement are that they're generally expected, or there's some hope that they're going to offset public payer reimbursements that may not always fully cover the costs, right? So commercial reimbursements may be a little bit higher. This is the well-known cost shift. And we know that FQHCs and hospital-owned practices take all comers, Medicaid, Medicare, um, in some cases, the uninsured. And so how, you know, when we're thinking about just generally, this is more of a philosophical question, but when we're thinking about uh, independent practices who have more latitude over which patients they serve, how should payer mix impact or factor into commercial reimbursement for, you know, independent providers? particularly if, if an independent provider makes the choice that they don't want to accept Medicaid patients or they don't want to accept many Medicaid patients, they have a low, you know, um, number of Medicaid patients that they're willing to serve. How sh should, I mean, I guess this is just a question, a philosophical question, should the reimbursement be adjusted for that? So um, it's, a, it's a great question, uh, Jessica, and it's not brought up very often. Um, but independent practices are not subsidized to take care of those patients currently, where the hospital and the FQHC, it's, they are. 
and actually Medicare and Medicaid are the best payers for uh, FQHCs, um, you know, sort of in general, there's nuances there, but um, there are least pay, you know, and, and we pay taxes. We're not, a, we're not a tax, you know, we're not, uh, a, you know, a nonprofit, you know, under that guise. So we do have to pay, pay taxes more um, in that sense. So we, we don't have the subsidies to take care of those populations. If we got the same subsidies, sh sure, it would be easier uh, to take care of those populations and not even have to consider it. I would love for all, and I think we all would love for everybody to be on the same fee schedules and on the same um, you know, pay payment uh, levels. Um, it would be so much better for, for Vermonters as a, whole, as a whole. I just have to quickly say, um, this concept of uh, independent practitioners uh, uh, making more than those in, in employed practice. Um, that, that, that's, that's not the, you really have to go back to, are they being paid the same per unit of work for the same amount of uh, uh, care? And that's not true whatsoever. Um, and the, the big difference is in independent practice, we are also the CEO, the CFO, we, uh, we, we, we clean out our own toilets, we paint our own walls, we sometimes trim the grass. Um, and all of that um, is in what we take home. So we might take home more, but we're being paid as executives and maintenance people as well. Um, so that's rarely considered. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. That's it for me, Kevin. You're on mute. Thanks. Next, we'll go to Maureen. Thanks. Um, uh, most of my questions have really been covered, but you know, a couple of things we haven't touched on is, you know, if the reimbursement, the provider reimbursement schedules were changed to be parity, you know, what would the impact be on insurance rates? So, I mean, it's just a question to throw out there. We we don't really know, right? Uh, it's not to say that you shouldn't be paid more. I'm not saying that at all, but it's just a matter too of saying if that reimbursement rate goes up, uh, the only way that's going to be paid for is through premiums by the by all the policyholders. And so, you know, has anyone even looked at what kind of cost that would be? So I guess, I guess that would really be just a question, and that could be for either on the insurance side uh, or for the providers, if anyone has any idea how much that, that could be. So Maureen, thank you. I, I'll take a quick shot at that. And we're, we, we've never asked for, for equ equity, equitable, you know, equal, um, right. just, just more accountability and fairness. Um, th there's probably very little justification anybody could give for being at, you know, 300, 350% of Medicare for anything, but yet here we are, we're there. There are a lot of things in commercial rates, um, and um, you know we typically are at in independent practice anywhere between 120 to 160 percent of Medicare um, for things. But um, so it's just there seems to be no accountability currently for having this huge disparity, um, and I think the fact that we have huge disparity takes away from from um, the payments available to everyone else. And so it's really a, a question of tamping down the the unreasonable levels and bringing them into into better alignment and accountability and transparency in some way, uh, not about equality. Right. So I think you bring up a point there too, with you know, it does go back to payer mix, which is um, in some cases when you say other payers are subsidized. The subsidy is almost through the commercial rate, right? So if if we look at some of the payers, um, if Medicare was 100%, Medicaid might be at 50%, and commercial might be at 200, right? But if if someone has all three of those, then the higher payment by commercial has to offset that they're taking those lower payers, and if you aren't always taking the lower payers, then you don't have that offset that you have to subsidize. So, so some of the subsidy is just in the fact that, you know, if a service, if they're paid out a certain amount across three payers, they may actually be underfunded, you know, for Medicaid, possibly Medicaid and Medicare and overfunded for commercial. Um, and, and that's where that whole payer mix comes in. And, you know, there, 
as Robin had kind of pointed out, any review that we would do, um, if it were our responsibility, would really push into the profitability of of a practice and looking at th those pieces, right? And understanding, you know, where where providers are making their money or not, right? That it would become a lot more visible then. And it seems in the past, when we've asked for any information just to help us um, to be informed, we haven't been able to get that, you know, from private practitioners. And and that that's the way it is right now. And that, that's not to say that's that should change, but it, if we were gonna, be looking at some of those rate settings and things. We would want, you know, full transparency on on all of that. So, just to just, add, I mean, it's, it's a pretty big lift. I mean, because it's not like independent practices are franchise, and Health First does not gather this information either. So, I mean, is the board prepared to look at um, financial information for you know the seventy plus independent practices in our network? I mean. No, and I would say it's not. That's not under what we're required to do right now either, right? So if it if it were something that we would be taking on, we would need resources as well to do that. Um, it's just trying to lay out there, making sure people understand, you know, what goes into to reviewing for rates that are approved for the hospitals, for instance, and things like that. And I'm sure you you guys have sat through those in the past and. And seeing some of the questions, but but this, you know, you know, the other thing I would hope this does is, you know, there are a lot of private practitioners out there in the same position, and you're talking to two of the insurance companies here as well, you know, and how you facilitate those conversations and work together um, to to get paid, you know, equitably. And you know some of these players, like MVP, is in other states as well. So I don't know how those things compare, but you know you would hope you give you a vehicle to be able to talk to the insurance companies as well. But that's all I had, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks, Maureen. Tom. Thank you, and I want to thank uh, both Susans for uh, convening this uh, this get together. Um, my my hope uh, is that we're well. My my, we're not going to resolve anything here today, but I think this is an important conversation to have. Uh, one reason is what uh, Georgia was talking about just a few minutes ago about the supply of uh, healthcare providers uh, in the state uh, being diminished uh, uh, with the assault of of the. Uh, of, of the virus. And, uh, you know, as Kevin knows, and as we all know that, you know, workforce in Vermont is a, is a difficult issue as it is. And if we are losing providers, um, you know, that are independent, um, then, you know, we're, we're kind of a, a wind in the face of what we're trying to do. Um, I'm not sure we're losing providers, but I would just want to be sure that, you know, to, to know, um, you know what the impact is. So, my my question will be uh, first question will be for Paul and Susan. But I just want to do a little preliminary on it. In that, you know, for me, I first met Paul and Susan at uh, this Health Thirst event up at uh, in Waterbury um, at the beginning of the year. And uh, at the end of the session, there were some cardiologists that came to me and said, "We can't make it. We haven't gotten an increase in X number of period." And we're private cardiologists, and for me, it was I didn't know whether that was true or not. So it was a trust but verify kind of approach I took, and I came back and I asked uh, Susan and Kevin, and just if could we do a little study? Um, and the cardiologist gave us some codes, cardiology codes that they use quite frequently, and we uh, um, and there were four of them. Uh, that we ended up scrubbing, and uh, they were put into two columns, uh, one being a non-hospital provide cardiologist and the other being hospital-aligned uh, uh, cardiologist. And so uh, for the four codes, uh, one co code 78452 was found to be equal across both sets of providers at $114. For code 93306, the uh, hospital was lower than the independent uh, cardiologist, $322 to $122. For code 92928, uh, 
the um, uh, non-hospital was lower at $699. These are median median uh, uh, statistics versus uh, $1,528 for the hospital-related uh, procedure. And for code uh, 93458, uh, the uh, median for the non-hospital folks was $309 uh, versus $771. So, well, for hospitals. So for me, that wasn't defining, but it was interesting that there is, you know, a lot of um, variation out there. And uh, uh, I visited the car cardiologist, and you could see from their office setting that uh, they're living pretty much hand to mouth and and pretty much stressed out. You get you you could sense that. So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about our hospital review process, which we, as Robin notes, we get into a lot of detail. Um, but the scale of the hospital review is also a big scale. Um, and then we go into the rate review process and we look at these medical trends and, and you know, those, but, you know, I'm not, I know that that's all proprietary information and we can't talk about it here, but both uh, insurers uh, kind of group information by hospitals, some by individual hospitals or groups, people that are in New Hampshire, people that are um, not regulated by the Green Mountain Care Board. And I, you know, and you can see the independent uh, folks in uh, in in those groupings. They're kind of separated out. And so I, you know, I couldn't relate what I'm seeing through rate review to what I'm hearing from folks out on, on the ground in the independent circles. It just, you know, there. Um, I'm I'm not going to re you know reveal the proprietary information, <laughs> but. Uh, the the, the 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 two were not aligned, uh, so to say. And so this is a conversation I, I hope you know that we can find some alignment and uh, uh, and but also keep in mind the scale of it. Uh, independent providers are not hospitals. They're not of that scale. Um, and if we are losing them because the you know the that the um, the amounts that are in the uh, rate review process for independence don't actually reach them on the ground, that would be something I would want to know um, and uh, and to try to at least uh, jawbone uh, the insurers into, you know, uh, uh, paying a, a reasonable amount. I, I, I worry that we are losing providers. I, I haven't, um, you know, and, and also in terms of, of the PT folks, I mean, we all know the letters that we get from all the PT saying they haven't had an increase in 15 years. So um, I guess my question for Susan and Paul, um, you know, is can you envision, can you come back with a proposal that, uh, that you know, uh, allows the rate review process to get a, a, a view into your world um, on a collective basis uh, that um, is, isn't as overbearing as what we require of hospitals, which is a full scrub, quarterly reports, tying out to audited financial statements, et cetera. Is there some middle ground we can we can find that that uh, allows you folks to engage in the rate review process in a productive way, but one that isn't overwhelming uh, for you or overwhelming for the board, you know, given given the scale of your uh, your your piece of the pie, the rate review pie uh, that uh, fall, that that falls to you. Um, I, I I do worry that we, you know I I hope that there's a there's a way to resolve this because if we're losing providers, you know because they're just kind of left by the side of the road and and we hear them but we don't act upon it, then um, I, I think that would be too bad. But but on on the other hand, there has to be a practical solution here. Where um, uh, you, you know we, we can we can meet somewhere in the middle. So that's my question. Can can, can you envision a process by which uh, the the independents can can enter this discussion in an organized and deliberate way? Uh, that's a, a, a great way to put it, Tom. Thank you for that. Um, Yes, uh, would be the easy answer, but um, it really depends on how extensive information is necessary. Um, and it's going to be very difficult, of course, to compare apples to apples in terms of 
how our practices are even you, you know listed on a on, on a uh, a balance sheet versus versus how a hospital is run or for instance you know how how, how uh, physicians are compensated in a in a uh, um, in a hospital system or even an FQHC versus uh, ind independent community practice. So, um, but yes, I think, I, I think, um, you know, providing uh, the basic information from practices on, on what their payer mix is, what their, um, what their reimbursement is as a percentage of Medicare, uh, perhaps. Um, and, uh, um, and, and those, those kind of data points that, and maybe the payers. I mean, the, yeah, the payers would probably have to free us up somewhat uh, from our for our ability to provide you with, uh, you know, what our fees are or our fee schedules are and how they're how they're derived. Susan, I, I was going to have the answer of, <laughs> we'll give it some thought and get back to you. Um. <laughs> well, I, I would also add to that. Um, that that the the information that we look at in this this area with the insurers is proprietary, and uh, you know I don't know if some proprietary you know kind of you know proprietary arrangements could could be uh, kind of crafted together that um, allows you folks to convey information to us as to what is happening in terms of your reimbursement rates um, in a e even in a group way. Um, um, or or benefiting from the proprietary process that you know that 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 we have. Um, we've just got to find a way to talk to each other um, and and solve this problem, um, especially since you're not a hospital, you're a small piece of the pie um, and uh, but an important piece of the pie, and uh, we need to pay pay attention to your problem in my view. I, I think in terms of uh, you know what Andrew had mentioned before, um, the, the the rate increase from year to year for hospitals versus is not giving you the the actual fees, but it's giving you the rate increases. And for instance, for our E and M um, from Blue Cross, we received zero increase in 2018 and two percent in 2019, zero in 2020, and next year is slated for zero increase as well. So for those four years of which we're about to enter another, we have a 2% increase. That's a half a percent per year. And, and I'm not telling you any fees, but I'm just telling you what the percent increase in our E&M has been. And again, as Susan mentioned, that's not sustainable um, because I know that the folks who are providing exactly the same type of care, uh, potentially, um, in other settings are getting significant increases in what they're being paid on those same E&M codes. So, um, so we can maybe start there and then work towards, you know, um, um, substantiating those numbers uh, amongst ourselves and working together on, you know, okay, that doesn't seem right. What more data can we then build on that? And can I chime in here a little bit, Chair Mullen? Go ahead. Um, and Sarah Lindbergh might. Also, I just want to clarify backing up to the data that Tom referenced where we, our team did do some analysis that was just on professional codes. So, and, and this is way out of my league, but when you, <laughs> when you look at, I, I, and the, in, as part of this discussion in different settings, there's variations. And so um, I did just want to clarify that it is not comparing apples to oranges. Um, and part of the work that our team is doing with the validation on with um, our data, as well as then leading up to our dashboard. Um, I know that the independent providers are part of those work groups. So I'm wondering, um, and I don't want to put more, more work on our team, but I'm wondering if Sarah Lindbergh and her team could follow up um, through that group, if, that's, if that makes sense, Sarah. And if it doesn't, we could talk about it offline. Yeah, sure. So yeah, we're just trying to to start, make sure, just validate information. So how do the financials that we're capturing in the database compare with those that um, providers are seeing versus those that the payers are recording in their financial records? Um, and once we have a handle on that, we can start to try and um, you know crack a very tough nut in trying to see how a procedure 
performed in a hospital setting compares to one in an, um, in a in a kind of outpatient non facility owned uh, setting, which sounds like it should be real easy, but unfortunately, I think it's going to keep us busy for a while. Can I jump in here with a question, Kevin? Sure, go ahead, Jess. Um, I'm actually, this is more directed towards Andrew and Matt, but I'm wondering, you know, we have the rate review process and then we have the hospital budget process that happens after the rate review process. And we've, in after the hospital budget process, actually had conversations about should we follow up with the carriers to understand after the hospital budget process, how did the decisions we made in the hospital budget process flow through to um, changes within uh, within the reimbursements for say inpatient and outpatient and maybe imaging or some big broad categories and understanding how it actually manifested the the commercial rate increases that we allowed how it actually manifested through the subcategories of the hospitals with a follow-up with um, the carriers and so I'm just wondering if we expanded that and at the end of the year would it be proprietary um, to also ask for a breakdown um, just of an aggregate, what was the aggregate increase in inpatient, you know, uh, increases outpatient imaging, and then independent, uh, maybe FQHCs, but and then independent primary to specialties, this big broad category, so we could see how the, the increases manifested themselves across all of the kind of big bucketed areas. Is that too proprietary? Is that too? Uh, confidential in terms of contract negotiations? Is there a way to aggregate it up to share that information? Yeah, I think if we aggregated that data across those categories, that, that would not be, um, that wouldn't be violating any contract that we've executed with anybody. Um, we would, you know, want to keep that, you know, within the Green Mountain Care Board, I think, at least initially, um, you know, but um, it's certainly analysis that we can do. There, there are some limitations, of course, because uh, we don't know exactly what goes on with hospital reimbursement. Um, so apples to apples can be a little bit tough there. But I, I think we can we can share what we know. Yeah. Because that might be helpful. I mean, I think that's pro that, that's what we're trying to understand here, right? Is how you know. How do these rate increases flow through the system um, in the various component parts? So it sounds like, from at least Blue Cross's perspective, that would be some version of that could be shared. And Matt, I don't know how you feel about the MVP side of things. But. I mean, I think similar to Andrew, I, I mean, I think it's possible, but certainly um, <laughs> I, I have to have the tagline that I'd have to run it by our legal department just to make sure we're in compliance with our contracts and depending how specifically the question's asked. But we can definitely look into that. One of the things that uh, has always frustrated me um, in a number of our processes, including um, hospital charges, is that we don't really um, get the luxury of seeing um, how they compare against each other as opposed to just talking about a percentage increase. So I'm, this question is for um, Alicia, Matt, and uh, Andrew. Um, do you benchmark against your peers? Um, so for Medicaid, do you look at reimbursements compared to other states when you're making decisions? And for the commercial payers, um, do you benchmark against other commercial payers across the country to see if your reimbursements are way low, way high, just right? Um, Alicia, we'll start with you. You've been awful quiet. <laughs> and thank you for the question. Um, I think for a lot of our methodologies, we do try to key off of Medicare's reimbursement, uh, both their approaches to structuring the rates, and um, we try to understand what we are able to pay as Medicaid relative to what Medicare is paying currently. So an example of that is uh, for our professional fee schedule um, for primary care services for the last several years, um, Vermont Medicaid has paid 100% of Medicare's rates for those primary care services. Uh, we're trying to maintain that level of 100% for Medicaid if we can. 
Um, we also try to do that benchmarking for other methodologies where there is uh, an appropriate Medicare equivalent. Uh, in some instances, Medicaid pays for services that Medicare doesn't necessarily cover. And so in those cases, um, we do try to compare ourselves to other sources. Um, in particular, we look at other Medicaid programs nationally, but more specifically, we try to look at Medicaid programs within the New England area. Um, and so that gives us a sense of where we are relative to our peers, uh, and in particular, uh, neighboring state Medicaid programs. Thank you, Alicia. Matt, Andrew? Uh, this is Matt. Um, it's actually similar for MVP that we do use Medicare as our, as our base. I mean, we are in the, we are in, you know, all product lines, you know, the main ones are being Medicare, Medicaid and the commercial product lines. So we, we do use uh, CMS as our benchmark and follow a lot of the CMS requirements on coverage guidelines and services. I can't get into specific rates, but that we do use CMS as the basis. Do you think you get to the just right or? I mean, I think I think MVP is very competitive in our regions. We actually we look at all our regions, specifically, you know, what we're paying, primary care, hospital based, et cetera. So uh, we obviously try to maintain that competitive competitive advantage, and um, you know, that's that that's a goal we have to report to our customers, our employers. Thanks, Matt. Andrew. Yeah, we also look primarily at. Um, well, the, the two major sources of information are government payers and then the direct feedback we get from our network providers. Oh, wait, can't tell if my camera is on or not. Sorry. My it hasn't been on all day. Um, all we do is hear you, Andrew. Okay. I can see myself. I'm so, sorry about that. Um, so, <laughs> I yeah, can we, see we, Andrew. You can? I can, yep. Wow. All I see is a blue ring. It must be what part of the state you're in. <laughs> Montpelier Black Hole. Uh, yeah, so we, we look at uh, Medicare, certainly, even though we have a proprietary fee schedule, we benchmark every fee on the fee schedule against Medicare. And then we also look at um, what uh, what's going on with Medicaid in Vermont. Um, a generation ago or more, it was common practice, I think, for health plans to um, sort of benchmark against each other in the commercial space, but that's not something um, that, that has been done for a long time because I, I think there were concerns about, about collusion or price fixing. So really, we keep our focus uh, on what's going on with Medicare, and maybe most importantly, what we're hearing back from providers. Like I said, we, ha we have a lot of discussions with co providers across the community each year about what's going on with their practices, how work is changing, um, and how reimbursement works or doesn't work in certain situations. And all of that factors into our, our management of the fee schedule. And then, you know, of course, what's going on with members and clients as well. Um, you know, it's very important to keep in mind that, and I, I know you all know this, every dollar, um, you know, that, that we spend um, to pay for care is, is dollars that are supplied by our members or uh, the uh, businesses and organizations across Vermont that purchase our products. So it's a, it's a real balancing act. So Andrew, follow up to that, um, and I'll just focus on you because I know that uh, Matt's company contracts with um, another um, national player for their um, out-of-state network, but you're part of the, the Blues network, and being part of that, is there ever any um, comparison by regions of reimbursements? No. No, no. the only thing... Now, you know, we see what um, we, we get blinded data every year that shows us um, relatively how much um, each payer pays in each state. So I can see, for example, that the Blue Cross plan in Arkansas uh, pays the third most or the first most, but I, I can't see who any of the other payers are and I can't see um, what they pay, only what, what their ranking is. Um, but Do you get chided at all if you're um, a higher payer um, for things than, than others around the country? Or, or no, is, you get ranked, but it doesn't really matter. Um, not by the association, but, but as Matt said, you know, we, we answer to the customers who are, are um, you know, counting on us to help them finance health care. So every, 
every customer RFP we've ever received has asked us to explain our reimbursement so that we can be compared, um, you know, to the other the other health plans that that clients are considering. So in in that case, we we can be penalized, um, you know, by the market uh, for paying too much or too little for services. Um, we we have had clients express concerns, you know, over the years about both of those things. Yeah, I mean, I th I think of it like as a Vermonter, we have so many snowbirds, and and uh, if they were going to uh, another state that was paying so much more than healthcare was here, then obviously that's driving up our cost of care. So I just would think that it would be <laughs> reciprocal in that respect. So I didn't know if there was any type of uh, natural check and balance on uh, what's happening around the country, but it doesn't sound like it. No. Generally, though, I will say that the blues plans tend to have very competitive reimbursement. And I think part of the reason for that uh, is because we provide a very high level of service, both to members and providers. Um, and that has typically, um, you know, translated into very strong relationships with, with provider systems. Great. Thank you. Um, before I turn it to the public, um, is there any further questions from the board? Hearing none, uh, I see that um, Susan Gutwin had her hand up for a very long period of time. So first of all, thank you for your um, patience, Sharon, and uh, go ahead with your comment or question. Thanks. Um, I've enjoyed listening to the conversation and I'm encouraged to hear the board include independent providers in what they feel is their purpose of approving um, <clears throat> rate increases. And I'm especially thrilled that the discussion uh, of you um, and Tom has gone into, okay, well, how do we, how do we go about doing it? And um, I would love to be a part of future discussions. I do not see us in the same category as a hospital. So the logistics of getting regulation in place cannot be compared to the hospital. We could group ourselves um, and, and frankly, we're, we really just don't have as much going on. Uh, if you look at my balance sheet and PNL, you can compare it to the hospital, you know, one takes a wagon, the other takes, you know, <laughs> just a, a folder. So, um, uh, and to look at salaries, the cost, where's the money going in independent practices versus hospitals and looking at the percentage. Okay. Uh, if, if we're getting this amount in revenue from our insurance payers, what percentage is going towards, towards the profit of the business and generally that goes to salaries um, if it's an independent practice. So there are ways to look at how reimbursement rates that the board approves has its outcome and and the fairness I think will be apparent um, once there is a system in place to take a look at it. So I'm I'm thrilled that today feels like a Friday to me. I want to celebrate that I feel for the first time that there's an interest in including um, independent uh, providers in 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 the health of the healthcare system. And then the one other thing I just wanted to um, question is, did everybody see the 60 minute story on uh, Sutter Hospital in Northern California? I think that we have similar um, behaviors here in the state of Vermont. And um, I, can, I can remember one of the statements was, well, that they get what we pay them because they ask. And of course, it's not 100%, but certainly what they they ask for in large part is coming through the uh, insurance payers to them to grow and to consume um, independent providers. So if we don't want to do this in the state of Vermont, now is an opportunistic time to take a look at the health of our independent providers. Thanks. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, uh, just for those who uh, um, weren't aware, there was a piece on 60 Minutes this past Sunday. So if anybody wanted to um, review that, they could probably go online and and uh, see it from this uh, past Sunday. 
it was an interesting uh, piece, Sharon. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, is there other public comment? Hey, Kevin, oh, this is Walter calling in from the phone. <laughs> go ahead, Walter, and then I'm going to call on Dale and then Rick. So go ahead, Walter. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, first of all, I do say I want I really enjoyed listening to this conversation. I can't get on the Microsoft team for unknown reasons, but I enjoyed listening to this seminar. It was a good one. I just want to comment on it, make a couple comments on some of the things brought up here tonight. Number one was the comment that this healthcare system is not a free market system. Healthcare should never be considered as a free market system. Uh, it's a public good. Second is the comment about value-based care. Uh, what is the meaning of value-based care? And that was a good one because <clears throat> a couple days ago I went to the doctor and I got 10 minutes and I was done. Now, is that value-based or is that not considered value-based? In and out, wham, bam, thank you, gone, reimbursed, hit up Medicare. Um, and a third concerns Robin's point that she made earlier about regulation. And I almost think that is the key in this multi-payer, confusing, crazy system with all its, jar with all its jargon that you don't know exactly what it's talking about, you know, what is value-based care, what is all payer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think Robin was right on with that point, that what is needed and then <clears throat> is much, much more regulation of this system. Um, and I know it's a huge task, involves the legislature and so on and so forth. But anyway, I just wanted to agree with her about that. And it, as a patient, it's so confusing to have to go through all this because you're bounced around between insurances, you know, you, you make too much, you're kicked off Medicaid, you, then you go back on the private insurance, and then you're kicked off Medicaid. And you go into an office and you get 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and then suddenly you get a bill that says you may owe this or that. You know, and that's kind of the way I look at all of this because you can talk about reimbursements, you can talk about value-based and how people are getting paid and so on and all that, but at the, at the bottom, it's the patients and all of us who are paying for this, and it is the patient that is <clears throat> the one that we serve. Um, whether you're an advocate, an activist, a board member, a board staffer, a physician, a nurse, whatever. And to go into a place, and I drove 40 miles for this, and to get 10 minutes, you know, and that's typical. It's not atypical. It's typical. It's rush you in and rush you out. So that's what I'm getting at in a... <clears throat> So it's the regulation, it's what is value-based care and who determines what is a value-based care, and it's that healthcare is not a free enterprise system. And thanks again for this. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Walter. Next, we're going to go to Dale Hackett and Rick Dooley, you're on deck. Dale? Yes, thank you very much. I did find this very interesting, very well done. Compliments to all of you. Um, and boy, it really is a complicated topic. Um, I made my head spin. How, how many years have I been following this? Um, but you touched on some topics that are very dear to me and have been for years. So I just want to comment that um, when it comes to reimbursement fees, example, um, I have hearing aids because I don't hear well. And while I'm thankful that Medicaid covers them, it was startling when I ha they stopped working. And while I'm due for a new pair, I couldn't get these fixed. And one of the reasons is, one, I'm due for a new pair. But two, um, the reimbursement cost for fixing them 
is more than the private practitioner gets reimbursed. And I hear these stories so often where it's like, well, if we, I send them out, I'm going to have to pay some of my own money because the reimbursement fee isn't going to cover the repair costs. And I'm thinking to myself, anybody that's got hearing aids, that is going to be chilling news to them because if you think of it more as a service needed, if you've got the hearing aids, it's like a repair service. And the idea of, oh, am I going to have to pay to get them fixed? Um, that increases my cost. And we aren't talking something that's cheap. The other thing that I hear in all of this and think about is the services not included. For example, reimbursement fee, like when I go to a neuroarthrologist, what is their reimbursement fee to um, pay for that visit, to pay for services needed, um, the writing of the prescription, or a certain test that need to be done? But what isn't going to get covered is the glasses, at which point I'm handed a prescription and I'm out asking the um place i go to to get the one or two prescriptions filled if they can find me a lab reasonable in price where i can pay for my glasses my glasses can cost more than 800 dollars a pair and i'm asking them to shop for something that is 300 dollars a pair and that's going to end up being my fee, which means I often can only afford one pair of glasses. So I heard like in these conversations where people were talking about being paid 250% of Medicare reimbursement rate. And that always leaves me puzzled when I know there's also reimbursement rates that don't even cover the cost. And there's never, there's never a cap on that. It's like how how can you pay less than the actual cost? It, especially if it's going to fall on the back of the consumer to cover that cost, this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I'm trying to talk about something that is just so complicated, how they throw this around. It works out for them in the balance sheet at the end of the year. Some get paid more, some get paid less as far as the services, what they negotiate. But just a reminder, sometimes that comes back to the consumer as the consumer picks up that difference. And that really staggers us because we aren't talking cheap in terms of what can be thrown at us. And so one, I'd love to see a cap where it's like nothing is covered in cost that's below the actual cost. Two, keep in mind, there's also services that aren't even included that are part of the overall package. So you're negotiating reimbursement costs on a package that's not even complete. I'm referring to like my glasses. You, you'll get half the service but the other half you're stuck with that's going to be your cost so it's not even a complete package hopefully that comment made sense and this overall discussion that's so complicated thank you dale appreciate it rick dooley sure thanks very much to the green mountain care board um so I have just a couple uh, sort of comments. Uh, the first is in terms of uh, reimbursement year to year with Blue Cross, and again, not revealing anything proprietary. Um, I, you know, I looked at our numbers before this meeting, um, and I have almost identical numbers to Paul in terms of our year to year um, increases. That would be, you know, uh, zero, then two percent, then zero, then zero um, over four years. So, um, so I presume they're both looking at the same data and I'm suspicious that if we did this for other independent practices that we'd find the, the same thing. So I'm a little puzzled, um, you know, by Andrew's statement that, you know, each year, um, there's a percent increase each year, maybe it's just specific codes, you know, but I looked at e &M codes that make up probably 85% of our, of our payment stream here. So, um, so I'm not sure how those numbers come into being, 
I do think the idea of having the insurers provide some of that insight, you know, even aggregate data saying, here's what went to the independent practices last year out of that budget that was approved, I think is, is a great idea. I think so we can say, okay, yeah, here's, you know, here's where the money is, is at least flowing and what impact it had. Um, I think in terms of the idea of um, independent practices sort of having a say in, in rates or anything of the sort, or, um, and I forget how it was worded, it was something about, you know, essentially saying that the insurers did have their sort of finger on the pulse of independent practices and had a, had a good feeling for healthcare you know, providers across the state. Um, I'm not sure that's entirely accurate. I would, I would say in conversations I've had, um, you know, with colleagues in different practices, um, there's not really a sense that the insurers sit and talk with independent practices. I think pretty much it's a, here's what the fee schedule is. Here's what we will pay you for this year. Um, and I don't know that anyone's had a lot of success saying, well, here's how our costs are up and geez, we need more money. And there's been a back and forth that really hasn't happened on a regular basis. Um, and maybe it should. And maybe that's one of the roles of the Green Mountain Care Board is to help facilitate, you know, maybe shine a spotlight on some of this and help facilitate some of those conversations. Understanding that you only regulate that 15% of the market, totally understand that, but certainly facilitating the conversations and, and um, you know, bringing them up into the light of day as much as we can, given the uh, yoga constraints, I think would be helpful. And the third thing I wanted to uh, just point out is that, you know, I'm, I'm uh, entering my quarter century mark in primary care since I started practice. So it's, you know, I've, I've, I started at a time when capitation was the, you know, going to save us all. And then we went back to fee for service and we had this sort of mixed capitation model. And now we're into this alternate, you know, alternate payment model. So, so I've kind of seen it all come full circle. And each time, um, I'm told the same thing each time it's, oh, we're going to invest in primary care and we're going to bring down costs. And, and, uh, but as I look at the numbers and I look at our, you know, increases over the years, I don't see an investment in primary care, certainly for my practice and for other independent practices. Um, I see more shifting of money going to the hospital each time those rate increases are approved. I see the vast majority of that money shifting to the hospital and I see primary care getting shortchanged each and every year, time and time again. So I just want to sort of implore the Green Mountain Care Board to understand that maybe we can't regulate our way out of this, but maybe we can have some conversations and just really talk about how to stop that trend of all money going to hospitals, you know, primary care and independence sort of sitting on the sidelines and picking up the scraps. Those are my only, only comments. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rick. And just a little uh, feedback. Um, we had a presentation this morning on a New England States um, consortium um, report that looked at primary care reimbursement for the six New England states. And um, what uh, they reported was that um, Vermont, as a percentage of its spending in the Medicaid program, is doing great compared to their peers, but maybe commercials a little bit behind their peers. So if you get a chance to watch that recording, Rick, I think it would be uh, something that would interest you. And thank you for your service in primary care. We need more primary care doctors. Thanks, I'll, I'll take a look. Thanks, Kevin. Other members of the public? Hearing none, I... Uh, I uh, want to thank every member of the panel. It was a very interesting conversation. And I especially want to thank our executive director. Um, she's right that she and I had a conversation with uh, um, Susan that uh, uh, kind of was the, uh, the fruit of having this uh, panel this afternoon. But after that, I delegated or dumped, depending on how you want to look at it, all the responsibilities for this afternoon on Susan Barrett. And she did a, a great job. So thank you, Susan. And um, with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Kevin, can I, Chair Mellon, can I just say one quick thing about Go just ahead, a follow up item? And thank you for the compliments. And I also have to uh, thank Abigail Conley, who assisted greatly in putting this all together and the panelists. Um, but thank you very much. Um, I do just see a, as a follow up, and I just wanted to get consensus from the board on this that. Um, I was planning on following up 
with Andrew and Matt to see if they could um, provide maybe a template of what they could produce in terms of that aggregate data um, on FQHCs, inpatient, outpatient, independence. Um, so that is an action step that we'll go ahead and take at the staff level. And I just wanted to, to just make sure you were aware of that and in, in, a, in, in uh, agreement with that next step. Can I make a, just a, a slight tweak to that or a request? Yeah. Just that, that I think that's great, and I'm just thinking that since given where we are, we're trying to move towards healthcare reform. It'd be helpful if that in that template, if there was a breakout or an account of rate increases that were going towards providers that were undertaking, you know, delivery system reform, and to the degree that some of that rate increase may be going towards investment and transformation, that's a you know that would be helpful for us to understand. Um, in you know, to Andrew's point about. Uh, why there may be rate increases for for delivery system transformation. Um, so I think thinking about that template would be really helpful, and we'll learn a lot from it. Um, to, to Robin's point earlier, what we can do with that information is going to depend on a lot of information that would have to come from independent providers um, about you know financials and things like that. But I think just understanding the rate increases and where they're going will be helpful. What we can do with it, I think, is limited by the information that we have about independent providers. But thank you. OK, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move. Second. Second. Tom moved to adjourn with Maureen seconding. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great rest of the day and uh, best wishes for the most joyous of holiday seasons, even though it uh, Maybe a little bit more isolated than a normal holiday. Um, we are getting close to a time where we can spend um, with others, and we all just need to be patient and get there. So be safe and have a great holiday. Thank you. You too.